Okay, let's take a look at my solutions here to practice test one. Hopefully you've already tried this entire thing on your own before watching this. So in all of these, we are calculating left-hand limits, right-hand limits, regular old limits, and evaluating functions. So here, for all of these, I'm looking here at negative five. I'm looking in this area, above and below negative five. From the left, that guy there, the function's approaching two. From the right, the function is approaching two. Since I got the same answer on both of those, that's the limit. This thing only exists if these both exist and are the same. The actual function value is where's the actual dot above or below negative five? And it's right there at two. This function is continuous at two. Now we look, or at, at negative five, it's continuous at negative five. Now let's look at negative one. As I approach from the left, that's what that little minus sign means. My y values are all, they're all, two, so they're getting closer and closer to two. But as I approach from the right, see, now I'm getting, I'm trying to get to negative one from the right, from the positive direction. My y values are going down to negative three. Since these two do not agree, the actual limit does not exist. This question saying, where is the solid dot? The solid dot is down here at negative three. Now in this row, we're looking at two. That's not negative two. That's two from the left. So I'm looking right here. So I've got two different pieces again. From the left, all the y values are approaching three. From the right, all the y values are approaching three. Since those two agree, that's the limit, three. This question saying, I don't care what point is supposed to be there, what y value is supposed to be there, that's the limit. This is saying, what y value are we actually using? Where is the solid dot? One. Okay. Places where the limit doesn't exist, the only place in this graph, because it's implied this graph goes on forever. The only place where the limit doesn't exist is right here at negative one. Where's the function not continuous? There's a jump discontinuity here, and there's a hole there. A function is discontinuous if one of three things happens, or let me say it the other way. To be continuous, the limit has to exist. So this guy is just out. His limit doesn't exist. He can't be continuous. The function value has to exist. If the function's not even defined there, then you can't be continuous there. Our function is defined everywhere. And thirdly, the limit and the function value must be the same. Here's a place where they're different. So that is a whole discontinuity. It's just a little hole in the graph. Where's the function not differentiable? Remember, in order to be differentiable, you must first be continuous. Differentiability implies continuity. So all of these places, you can't possibly have a derivative if you're not even continuous. There's no derivative here at two, there's no derivative here. But there's another thing that can happen, actually two other things. You might have an infinite slope, you might have an asymptote, or you might have a kink. Anytime you have a sharp corner in a graph, the derivative is not defined there because the slope on this side would not agree with the slope on this side. So three places where the derivative does not exist. That's what this means. Okay, if somebody asks you to calculate a limit, first thing you try is just plugging the value in. If you get a number, you're done. 
So if you were to try plugging negative three top and bottom here, you would get zero over zero. Maybe I'll even write that on here just as a hint to myself that I'm supposed to be doing this kind of work. So maybe we might write goes like, this is not mathy notation. This is just something you might write to yourself. This goes like zero over zero. Anytime you get zero over zero, that means you're supposed to factor everything or somehow make the offending guy cancel out. So top and bottom factor here and X plus three cancels out. That's what was giving me zero over zero. Negative three plus three is zero. So I cancel those out and then I try again. Try plugging in negative three. And when you do that, you just get six. If you can plug it in and you get an answer, you're done. That's the limit. Notice that I had to write limited every step until this moment. That's when I actually calculated the limit. When you plug it in, that's when you stop writing limit. Same game here. If I were to plug in 25, square root of 25 is 5, minus 5 is 0, 25 minus 25 is 0. This goes like 0 over 0. That tells me I've got work to do. So with these radical ones, you multiply top and bottom by the conjugate of that radical. So I've multiplied top and bottom by root x plus 5 here. Leave this one in factor. Don't multiply those out. On the top, you FOIL. So root x times root x is x. Then your outers and your inners are going to cancel by design, then negative 5 times positive 5 is minus 25. Oh, look, the x minus 25s cancel out. That's who was causing the problem. The 0 over 0 just disappeared. Now I try plugging in again, and you can follow the work here. You get 110. Here, if I were to plug in 1, I don't care about the plus right now. If I plug in 1, this would go like 3 over 0. That's not a negative. That's what my little goes like symbol. If you get 0 over 0, you got yourself some canceling to do. If you get a non-zero over 0, you got yourself an infinity. So we got to think about the graph of this guy. Or we could just plug in values of x slightly bigger than 1 and see whether we get a positive or a negative. If you think about this guy's graph, it's got a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. His graph looks like this. From the right, this guy is approaching infinity. From the left, it's negative infinity. So the actual limit doesn't exist. This limit really doesn't exist either. So. Like if the question just said, does the limit exist? You would say, no, it doesn't exist. So that equals there is kind of a lie, but that's still what we write. This limit doesn't exist under any definition because I'm getting two different infinities. Okay, same game here, plug in four. This guy goes like zero over zero. You can check that on your own. Do all your factoring. You got to be good at factoring. The x minus 4 cancels, or one of them does, and we try plugging in again, and you get 0 over 3. 0 on the bottom is some kind of infinity. 0 on the top, that's just 0. This one will get a lot of people on an actual test. They overthink it. If you get 0 over 3, that's just 0. Here, first thing you try is plugging it in. Plug in two and see what happens. This is a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous. The limit of a polynomial is the function value itself. Just plug it in. And so you can check my arithmetic there. Hopefully I got the arithmetic right. Just plug it in. Okay, now we're talking about inf or limits at infinity. Asymptotic behavior. 
Here we look at the degree of the top versus degree of the bottom. If the bottom's bigger, like in this case, the answer is zero. If the top's bigger, then we got to think it's going to be either plus or minus infinity. We really just look at the leading coefficients here and think what that graph would look like. So we're really thinking about 3x to the fourth over x squared. That's what this guy will go like. That's 3x squared. His graph looks like this. So his limit as x approaches infinity is infinity. In this one, we have the same degree, top and bottom. I don't care about all these other numbers. Seventh degree, seventh degree. Then the limit as x goes to infinity is just the ratio of leading coefficients, five over eight. Okay, here we want to make this piecewise defined function continuous. So we need all our left and right hand limits to agree. So here's one of my, my points of contention, negative two. When I approach negative two from below, the limit as x approaches negative two from the left, from below, this is my function, all my y values are zero. When I approach from above, so I'm just looking at this little piece right here. So x is going toward negative two, then this guy's limit will be see, from above. I'm just plugging negative two into this formula here. I get negative four plus a, but these two have to be the same. These two pieces, this is all I'm really doing. These two pieces must match up at this value. And then similarly, you can look through all my work here. These two pieces must match up at four. So the first equation just told me a equals four. So I'm going to use that from now on. And then you get b equals four also. Okay, here we're playing with our limit laws. We're distributing a limit across the addition. We're pulling constants out, and then we know the values. And you can check all the arithmetic there. There's nothing really fancy there. Okay, here I'm asked to find the value of the derivative at that point right there. The value of the derivative is the slope of the tangent line that's tangent at that point. So they've drawn the tangent line for me. So I just picked out two obvious points on that tangent line right there. We got that point there, negative 3, 1, and that point 2, 0. And I just found the slope of the, the line that passes through those two points. I'm just looking for the equation of this line here. And there's a slope, just changing y over changing x. And then I know in college algebra, you were always told your best friend is y equals mx plus b when it comes to equation of a line. And a lot of times it is. But in this class, point slope form is much better. I know the slope. I just found it. And I know a point. I know the point negative 3, 1. So I'm plugging in negative 3, 1, and that slope I just found. And then just leave it like that. OK, now we're going to have a bunch of problems finding the derivative at a point, finding the derivative as a function, using the definition. These have to be written up like this. Like you're going to have these problems on the test. You're going to have a bunch of written assignments like this. You have to write them up like this. You got to write limit as h goes to zero all the way down until that very last step when you actually plug in h equals zero. Okay, so we're going to practice a bunch of these. Hopefully you've already practiced some of these. Don't forget to put the over h at every step. Like 
When you write yours up, it should look literally exactly like this. Sometimes people will skip writing out this step right here. They'll go straight from here to here. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. That's the only step in here you can skip. I guess you don't have to write the definition here. So it's not 100% necessary you write this line or this one. Everything else, if it's, you see it on your screen right now, it's required for full credit. Now that we've got the derivative at the point a equals three at the x value a equals three we know that the slope of that tangent line is 24 again i'm going to use y minus y naught equals m x minus x naught i know m i already know my x value i just got to find my y value a lot of mistakes happen here. They think that that's a y value there. It, it is, but it's a y value on the derivative. I need the y value on the original function. So I need to plug that three back into the original function to get this y value. Okay, here's another one. Now we're finding the derivative as a function of this quadratic. Hopefully you've practiced a lot of these. Your solution has to look exactly like this. Again, every now and again, people will skip this step right here. They'll, they'll factor out the H and cancel it in their head. They'll go straight from here to here. That's okay. Everything else you see here is required. Notice I wrote limit as h goes to zero all the way down. I tried to keep my equal signs lined up. I'm over h at every step until that line right there when h actually cancels out. Then once you get down here, you can plug in h equals zero. And there's your derivative. This one's a little trickier. Same idea, but there's some working with complex fractions here. So I'll go through a little more detail on this. So we want limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. You should have that memorized by now. f of x plus h means replacing that x right there with an x plus h, leaving everything else alone. Minus, here's f of x, that f of x right there. Now, in order to add these fractions, I have to get a common denominator. So the common denominator is going to be those two multiplied together. So I got to multiply top and bottom of this guy by x plus 4 and top and bottom of this guy by x plus h plus 4. Then I'm going to distribute. Remember, that's a minus, so distribute that minus there. We're going to get a bunch of canceling. The only thing that's left on top will be a negative 3h. Now, this is a fraction divided by a fraction. You could think of this as fraction divided by h over 1. So to divide fractions, it's keep, change this to multiply, and flip this one over. So that's what happened here. I did a little keep, change, flip. So instead of dividing by h over 1, I'm multiplying by 1 over h. The h is cancel. They're going to every time when you're calculating a derivative. That h is going to cancel. Now at this point, I can just plug in h equals 0. I wanted to plug in h equals 0 up here. When you're doing a limit, that's what you want to do. You want to just plug it in. But if you try that, you're going to get 0 over 0. Now that h is canceled, I can try again. Plug in h equals 0. This will be x plus 4 times x plus 4, which is x plus 4 squared. So this is my derivative function for that function f. OK, exact same game here, only now we've got a radical. 
So anytime you're calculating a limit with a radical, you're going to multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. So there's a lot of complicated algebra here. But this is really just algebra. All the calculus is buried there in writing limit. That's the only calculus in the problem. It's all algebra. So multiply top and bottom by the conjugate. Notice I've got over H here. Notice I'm writing limit every step. Now we've got a foil here on top. That's the same thing. So I'm just taking that thing times itself. Four times four is 16. Any root times itself is just the stuff inside. Same game here for the last. Remember foil, first, outer, inner, last. For the last, negative four times positive four, that's the negative 16. Root x minus three times itself is just x minus three. Now, what about the outers and the inners? Those will cancel. That's why we did the conjugate there. That guy times that guy is 16 times both radicals. This one's negative 16 times both radicals. They cancel. Okay, I distribute everywhere here and I get a whole bunch of cancellation. The only thing that doesn't cancel is 16H. Oh, good. That's going to cancel out my H. If your H doesn't cancel, you've done goof. Once you cancel the H, now we're ready to actually take the limit. Plug in H equals zero. There's my only H left over right there. And then you'll see that we end up with like terms. So we add those together. And then the 16 over 8, we can just cancel and call two. Okay, hey, here we're throwing a rock. Uh, it's 64 feet up in the air at time zero. We're just dropping it. Here is our function, our position as a function of time. So I want to know once the rock hit the ground, that means when is y equals zero. I'm solving for the time. Simple quadratic, move the 64 over, divide by negative 16. Like, you should just be able to do that. Technically, we get two times plus and minus two, but the negative two is not part of our domain of interest here. So we're only going to take the positive two seconds. Velocity is the derivative of position. With respect to time here, my independent variable is time. Notice I have no X's. They're all T's. Now, I could. I've got two choices. I could take the derivative specifically at the number two, like we did in this problem here. This one. We found the derivative at a particular number. No X's, no t's i just had a number everywhere three i could absolutely play the same game here just find the derivative at t equals two or i could just find the derivative as a function and then plug in two at the end and i think that's much easier so we want the limit as h approaches zero of f of t plus h minus f of t all over H. And we're going to, like, you're going to do this so many times. X plus H squared is X squared plus 2X, XH plus H squared. In this case, T squared plus 2TH plus H squared. You got to be careful distributing this minus here. And then clean up. You can check all the steps here. This is what your derivative should look like. You get negative 32t. Then finally, I can plug in a time of 2. We, so negative 32 times 2, negative 64 feet per second. Those are our units here because distance was measured in feet. Time was measured in seconds. And a derivative is always a rate of change. Change in y per change in x. In this case, X is played by the role, or the role of X is played by T. Okay, we've done this problem before. 
So the first part says, which vehicle traveled further at two seconds? So we're looking at position versus time. At two seconds, car G is only one foot away. Yeah. Car F is two feet away. F has gone further. Let's find the speeds, the velocities at three seconds. Velocity is the derivative of position. It is the slope of the tangent line at that point. F is just a line. All of his tangent lines have the same slope, the slope of the line itself. You should just be able to look at that guy and see that he has slope one, that blue line. I mean, here's a point zero, zero. Here's a point one, one, two, two, three, three. His slope was one foot per second. G prime, and we did a little bit of work here. We have to kind of, I drew in the tangent line here. And I don't know if my drawing's perfect, but on the way I see it, where I think it would cross would be right there at the point two, zero. So that's a slope of over one up two. G's instantaneous velocity is about two feet per second. So who's moving faster at time four? Right there at that spot. Who's got the biggest slope? F slope is still one. G slope. If I were to draw in a tangent line right there on that, that orange curve, his tangent line would kind of look like this. Kind of overdid it there, but you get the point. It's much steeper. So G is moving much faster. What about their positions? Who's moved further? Well, they, they hit each other right there. See, G starts off going slow. Look how, how shallow his tangent lines are. But then G speeds up towards the end. F is going at constant speed the whole time. But they happen to match up perfectly, and they're at exactly the same position at four seconds. They're both four feet away. Okay, that's a good place to stop.